In 2007, the Northern Territory or the Australian government um, announced the Northern Territory emergency response into Aboriginal communities. Um, basically, this legislation and the announcement was to um, go in to basically stop uh, the child sex abuse, antisocial behaviour, the um, violence and the alcohol that, um, that the problems that are amongst Aboriginal people here in the Northern Territory. Aspects of the emergency response was um, scrapping the permit system into Aboriginal communities. Uh, that gave, the permit system actually gave Aboriginal people protection of their lands and communities, especially around sacred sites, uh, carpet baggers, um, and, um, yeah. Uh, and the other aspect was scrapping the CDEP. CDEP is Community Development Employment Program where that was the main resource um, for Aboriginal people as for employment and for income. Uh, the Northern Territory Police had actually given um, extra Star Chamber powers where they treat Aboriginal people as terrorists. Um, customary law was uh, not taken into consideration when sentencing Aboriginal people uh, to jail. General business managers were put into communities to, um, I guess, engage with the Aboriginal people living in communities uh, and also advise the government on Uh, on the communities and what's been happening in those communities. Income management, they made amendments to the Social Securities Act to here in Australia to income manage our welfare payments or social security payments of 50%. So we get 50% of our welfare or Centrelink payments or social security payments in cash and the other 50% goes into income management and income management was brought into the Aboriginal communities because they believe or the government believes that a lot of children are neglected a lot of our monies get spent on alcohol and gambling um, they made amendments to the Land Rights Act of 1976 to actually compulsory acquire all Aboriginal communal areas or communities. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the main aspects of the intervention that I mainly speak of. The intervention legislation, I guess, is now a um, recreation of past policies to assimilate Aboriginal people. Um, they believe that Aboriginal people are not as normal as the rest of Australia. So what they want to do is actually bring the living conditions and the way Aboriginal people um, are at the current stage up to um, the national standards of living, education and employment. Um, the words that were mainly used when the intervention was rolled out was normalisation. So, so 
by the meaning of that, they're saying that Aboriginal people aren't normal and they wanted to bring up, um, bring us up to the standards and as the rest of Australia, I guess. My fight and struggle in the campaign against the intervention is that basic human rights were violated um, under the intervention because of the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975 was actually suspended to roll out this policy or legislation to only Aboriginal people. Um, and basically it just the unfairness that the Aboriginal people have received since, I guess, 1788 when the first white man landed in Australia and then colonisation started. And Abor Aboriginal people in Australia have always been treated differently. Um, in the past they had a had a policy where remo removing light-skinned Aboriginal children from their mothers and their traditional country, and that is known today as the Stolen Generation. Is the noise okay? Um, so yeah, I see myself as a responsible Aboriginal woman um, who provides for her family. And I, and I believe that there are a lot of good Aboriginal people who do the right thing. Aboriginal people here in Australia are very family orientated people. So in a household, whether if it's on a town camp, outstation or community, we do have one family living in one house and we have more than one generation living in one house. So under the intervention with the new housing that they're offering, they're offering us uh, millions of dollars to take over our lands or to sublease our communal lands um, to give us new housing, refurbishments, upgrades. <coughs> So basically they want us to have one family per house and one, I guess, one child per room. Um, in reality, that is not going to happen. I believe that there will be a lot of homelessness and there'll be more overcrowded situations. Um, and, and slowly different Aboriginal people will, be, will, will begin to move off their own traditional communities into the new township hubs or smaller towns that they're trying to set up in the territory under the Shire Council system. Yeah, so what I am trying to achieve, I guess, is basic human rights should be heard. I, I believe that, um, I believe in freedom of choice and a freedom of speech. If there are people um, a bit unsure of themselves to speak out, then somebody has to do it and let their voices be heard. To me, self-determination, I guess, is where Aboriginal people have full ownership of their organisations um, and their programs, I guess, when initiating programs that'll help Aboriginal people. And those programs actually need to come to and from Aboriginal people. And basically, it's Aboriginal people taking care of Aboriginal business, um, more or less Aboriginal control of Aboriginal affairs. And that's, that's one step in um, developing self-determination among Aboriginal people.
And to achieve that, everybody has to stand as one, as a um, stand in one in unity, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, and hopefully the government will listen. But at the moment, the government actually listens to their hand-picked Aboriginal, I guess, token blacks. Um, yeah, and, and, and just not everyone. Um, with the constitution, before 1967, with the referendum and the yes-no vote for um, Aboriginals to become citizens of their own country, I guess, before 1967, we were actually in the constitution as flora and fauna, part of the land, but now we are recognised as citizens of our own country. Um, I think now Aboriginal people need to be added into the constitution because um, there is this thing called terra analysis where they found or was reported in the past where this land was a vacant land before um, white men came. But they did not realise that there were actual living beings here, traditional indigenous Aboriginal living here in Australia before 1788. If I have the power, had the power, or if there is a change of government, I would like to see more Aboriginal people in government. Maybe we have our own political party, Indigenous political party. Um, I would give recognition to a lot of Indigenous peoples here in Australia, Aboriginal people. Um, I would put the declaration um, on the rights of Indigenous peoples in the constitution where us Aboriginal people are recognised. Um, I, yeah, I haven't really thought about it much, but I, I think um, those other areas and plus would constitutional change as well. Um, I would like to see a lot of Aboriginal people achieve their goals in the communities, especially where um, if they are determined, you know, as part of self-determination to actually um, have the education and training that they need to actually run their own communities, their own organisations, and I guess the give the people a choice and probably hear the voices and go from there. It's all about what the people want, not what the government should be doing. And I, and I think that's where the freedom of choice is, the freedom of speech, you know? Yeah. If I had the power, I'd, I'd listen to the people power. The people power, you know, that's a power by the numbers, and if you can get the people together, I think that, you know, that's where the change has to come from. The people power. Really? Yeah, there are 20 town camps, two are without special purpose leases. Our town camps were acquired in 1974 um, in perpetuity so we have our 10 camp leases forever and a day 
their um, uh, between 2,000 to 4,000 Aboriginal people living on town camps, um, give or take whatever time of year it is. Um, there are between 150 to 160 houses on our town camps. Most of them are run down, uh, not worth living in. Our homes on our town camps are actually overcrowded. There are more people than bedrooms in our houses. Our, our town camp homes or the houses on our town camps are over 30 years old, most of them. Uh, basically they are just shells to people. Um, when you get overcrowding situations then the house then becomes a ruin basically. Um, it's been hard for Aboriginal people to look after their homes, especially when you've got more than one family living in a house or um, more than one generation living in a house. So our town camps and houses are in fact third world uh, conditions or even worse. Really? Aboriginal people um, the Aboriginal people here in Australia are 2% of the population. Here in the Northern Territory, we are 10%. Most of us Aboriginal people uh, live below the poverty line. Uh, we are low income earners. Um, we, most of us are unemployed. We have l low numeracy and literacy skills. We don't have that proper education that most of us would like. Um, so yeah, we are in fact the lowest of the low here in, Alice, in the Northern Territory and Australia wide. Back in the old days <clears throat> when um, the Overland Telegraph Station was put through the Territory, um, even with pastoral leases like cattle stations where uh, way out in remote Australia there are um, pastoral leases where they run live, uh, livestock. Um, so after basically a lot of Aboriginal people were massacred, uh, killed off, chased from their traditional lands, rounded up, put onto reserves and missions, uh, which was mainly run by the station owners or the cattlemen and the churches. Here in Central Australia, um, they began to take half-caste children away from their traditional lands, their culture, their mothers, put into or placed them in the old telegraph station. <coughs> And so uh, 
the families then moved into town to Alice Springs. There were already Aboriginal people living in or around in the surroundings of Alice Springs when it was a smaller town. Then in 1974, or even the 60s, they actually built a small area to put, uh, they called it the Rainbow Cottages, where you had many different Aboriginals of different colour living from different areas um, of Central Australia. So now, and the people that did not move, want to move into these cottages then stayed where they were, which was on the fringes of Alice Springs. In 1974, between 72 and 74, Aboriginal people or the founders of Tungunjura Council and our town camps were actually working on acquiring our town, our town camps at the moment um, as special purpose leases in perpetuity. And that's how Aboriginal people came to live on town camps as a communal living. So here you, uh, we have here in Alice Springs, our town camps are geographically mapped out. So you've got the western communities with the western camps, you've got the northern communities with the northern camps, the eastern camp communities with the eastern camps and south communities with the southern camps. And it's mainly family based or tribal based, but it's mainly geographically mapped out. Um, this camp alone, Mount Nancy, when it was first acquired, it was mainly an Majira and Kadij people living here. And the majority of people that live here are Kadij and, and Majira here at the moment still. There's a lot of problems, a lot of issues. Um, I guess. Uh, in 2007, our previous government announced uh, the emergency, uh, the Northern Territory emergency response into Aboriginal communities. Uh, that's outbush in remote area, outstations and our town camps. And basically it was the emergency response to stop child sex abuse among Aboriginal families. Um, today what we face are um, a lot of issues relating to social behaviour, alcoholism, violence, um, a lack of housing, lack of resources and a lack of funding. Um, and the only way that the government can fix it is to have an emergency response to come into Aboriginal communities and basically to try and fix those problems. Before the intervention legislation, uh, there was a report called The Little Children Are Sacred Report. And that basically tells stories of child sex abuse um, and how the government should actually fund communities properly to put in program, put programs in place that alleviates all social problems, domestic violence and the alcoholism that goes on between Aboriginal people. They, the, the government themselves, believe that there are pedophile rings in every community and that every Aboriginal person drinks alcohol and abuses their children. What I am campaigning for is human rights 
and to get Aboriginal people recognised, especially those Aboriginal people who are responsible for their families, uh, that do not drink, do not do drugs, and do not abuse their children. Well, with the, 90, with the Little Children of Sacred Report, there's 90 recommendations, and not one of those recommendations um, mention land. When you read the Northern Territory Emergency Response Legislation, there are 700 pages, and that's got nothing to do with saving children. So when I began to campaign for our rights against the intervention, we believed that it was a land grab. Um, they've already began to do exploration uh, in, way out in remote communities, um, and especially where Aboriginal people have native title to. They are calling Oh, and the most minerals that they are finding when, do, when doing exploration is in fact uranium. And, yeah. And, and also when taking over our tan camps or subleasing our Aboriginal lands or community lands to the government, um, it's for the government to actually protect their investments. Uh, what they'd, so their investments would be the money and they'd control the money coming into the community. Um, so what they want to do to the Aboriginal communities is actually bring them up to the standard of the rest of Australia. Um, and even with the living conditions. Um, yeah, because they believe that all Australians should be equal, but when you look at the legislation that was put upon Aboriginal people, it's not um, actually helping us. You know, we, we are in worse conditions than we were before. Um, there's basically no real help except, you know, give us your land, we'll give you the money to fix your homes, but there's no new homes promised as yet um, in a lot of areas in the Northern Territory. A lot of money is being spent on refurbishment, so basically um, renovations or major repairs and maintenance. Here in Central Australia, we are, or the government is focusing on three communities. Um, and these three communities are in a negotiation process where they also have been asked to give up their community list and hand over to the government. Um, these three major communities are also based around uh, mines. So what, at the end of the day, Aboriginal people in other communities are going to have to compete with the the three communities and these three communities are basically going to be set up as smaller town smaller communities um, or smaller townships and they're calling them township hubs so they are going to be a township hub that'll have services to deliver to the smaller communities but then it's slowly the the government is actually going to fund 
or put more money and more investments into the township hubs, which then the smaller com communities will be uh, starved out of existence. So you're going to have one group, a small group of community members slowly moving off their communities into the larger communities. Um, like here in Alice Springs, we call it the influx, where people are moving from one community and coming into the larger communities for the services. Um, yeah. Well, what I believe in, and I've always said it, is for non-Aboriginal people to work with Aboriginal people is that they have to meet in the middle and move forward. That's basically not going to happen in the long run. But at the end of the day, hopefully, Aboriginal people will have the strength to lead to self-determination, then will be able to govern themselves and provide for themselves. Before uh, the white man came to Australia, there was over 600 languages or language groups, but these days there are between 250 to 200 languages left um, to get us Aboriginal people up to standard. Um, they are taking Aboriginal languages out of schools or out of community schools because they believe or the government believes that we have to speak the one universal language which is English. Um, unfortunate for me, I uh, grew up as an English speaker but I um, have or understand basic different languages. Um, for Aboriginal people uh, to head down the road of self-determination, I guess there needs to be a constitutional change. Now that Australia has endorsed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, they believe, or we uh, Aboriginal people believe that, yeah, the constitution needs to change here in Australia where um, we then can have a Bill of Rights and hopefully out of the Bill of Rights us Aboriginal people can be recognised as um, the First Nation or First Peoples of Australia and gives us recognition to all the good work and goodwill that Aboriginal people will then be able to move forward with non-Aboriginal people and I think there are a lot of non-Aboriginal people here in Australia that are ignorant and they need to learn a bit more about our ways of living and our um, culture. Identity means to me is a place of belonging, um, where you come from and where your role is um, played in your community uh, and just the sense of belonging to culture, to land, having language. So. Identity to me is basically who you are and um, the difference as belonging to 
people, belonging to country, belonging to your culture. Basically, your cultural rights. Well, living in a world of democracy, I guess, the freedom of speech, um, and just expressing yourself, and having points of views, and uh, I think points of views when people want to raise their concerns, I think the rest of Australia actually needs to listen, especially when we are the first world, you know, first Australians and that um, we do have a sense of belonging to this country and we do have our traditional cultural lifestyles that still exist today amongst Aboriginal people. I think um, with democracy, I think, yeah, our, we actually need to be heard. We are peoples too with concerns and issues that we need to work together and tackle. So, yeah, that's how I believe in democracy is um, the change that will bring forth for Aboriginal people here in Australia. Here in Australia, we do not live in a democracy world here in Australia because points of views that people have do not um, get heard. But I think self-determination will then lead to a democracy amongst Aboriginal people. We do have um, Aboriginal people that live in communities and run their organisation, you know, that is self-governed and uh, that's a part of self-determination but with docu um, democracy it's a bit hard here in Australia when you have conservative um, governments uh, that are there for themselves and not for everyone. I think for to live in a democracy, a world of democracy, I think you need to be there for everyone, and you have to listen to everybody, black or white, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, um, people with differences. I, 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 and that's where it needs to change. Really. Yeah, I believe in human rights. I, I think a lot of people need to stand up for themselves, um, especially when you are living in a first world country where indigenous peoples are being treated as, and living in third world conditions. I believe that human rights is for everyone, everywhere.